Give us your name, rank, and branch of service. My name is Nicholas Dimetrochina. My rank was Gunnery Sergeant, E7, United States Marine Corps. Okay, so you stand, you set up pridefully. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, you know, they, the saying is, once a Marine, always a Marine. Exactly, no uh, one, doubt about that. Once you go through that crucible of fire, of boot camp, forever, you're going to be a Marine. Tell us about your area of expertise. I was a helicopter mechanic and eventually became a crew chief or a flight engineer on the CH-46, which is a tandem rotor helicopter. Um, I did that work for about 16 years. And then my last six years, I was a presidential support specialist with Marine Helicopter Squadron 1, um, supporting the President of the United States, foreign dignitaries, vice president, and others as directed by the Department of Defense. Now that's about as intriguing as it gets, let me tell you. It, it was a very interesting time in my life, well, to say the least. I understand that. Uh, now, give, I, I had asked you this before, but let, let's outline the years again. Your era would have been? I was, uh, went to boot camp in October of 1988, mm -hmm. and I retired in March of 2011. Now, back in 88, where'd you go to boot camp? I went to boot camp in San Diego, so I'm, I'm one of those Hollywood Marines. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a little luckier than others? A little luckier than others, yes. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Did you have some type of background that put you automatically on a, on a quick path to, to the job that you served in? Uh, in the I had no mechanical experience prior to. Really? Um, just based on the aptitude tests that you're given. Um, I came in as an open contract, which means I had no guaranteed job. The Marine Corps would just put me where they best saw fit. And uh, fortunately, I ended up in, in the aviation unit. Now, Nick, were you ever deployed in any type of conflict? Yes, I was. Uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I, I did that one. Okay. Uh, then back to the Gulf again for operations Desert Fox and Deny Flight. Okay. And then back again for uh, to Iraq for Operation Enduring Freedom. Or I'm sorry, Iraqi Freedom. Okay. For two tours. Wow, that's that's kind of a mouthful right there. Yes, and then you know several pretty much unknown or unnamed combat operations. Okay. Uh, the big one being Operation Stabilize, which mm -hmm. saw the separation of East Timor from Timor-Leste okay. and become its own country. Okay. Um, we were there as a quote unquote peacekeeping mission okay. to support okay. them in their fledgling democracy. Whereabouts is that? Uh, it's down near Australia, okay. so in the Borneo Archipelago area. Okay. Right. And it was an Australian led operation, but we were there in support. Okay. All righty. Okay. How, how did that go in support of, a, of another nation like that? Um, it was amazing okay. to be there for the birth of a country and to see the president of the country. You know, my one of my fondest memories, and I'm like a little emotional here, yeah. was the new president of East Timor. We were giving him a brief on helicopter operations because we were flying him to someplace else. Mm -hmm. And when I was done giving my brief, he came up and gave me a hug and said, thank you for helping my country. Wow. By far and above the most rewarding mm -hmm. situation, rewarding thing that, some, that anyone's ever said to me in my life. Right. Thank you for helping my country. Yeah, it's kind of, you, you don't expect, you don't get that every every so often. <laughs> no, it was, it, was, it was a pretty deep moment. Right, um, as right. you can see, I'm getting a little emotional talking about it. When you're talking about that helicopter, yes. uh, what's the crew, how, how big's the crew, what's it like? It's a crew of usually three, so okay. two pilots and a crew chief, which was my job. And then during combat operations, you'll have two pilots, a crew chief, and two door gunners. Okay. Uh, the capability of lifting 18 fully loaded combat troops or 20 to 25 folks that are not in combat gear. Okay, kind of an air, the air version of a landing craft? Sort of, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you, can, you can say like that. We did a lot of troop transports mm -hmm. uh, and cargo, mm -hmm. um, ship to shore operations, uh, shore to shore operations, mm -hmm. um, just depending upon what the dictate mission, you know, the mission dictates for us. Any dicey situations? Uh, yeah, I had a couple. Uh, actually, mo my most dicey situations were in non-combat situations. Really? Can, can, you, can you tell us about them? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, so my first tour of duty was in Hawaii. Okay. Good living for a 19-year-old kid. And um, we were, there's a training area over mm. on the island of Molokai. Mm. And we were, we were based out of uh, the island of Oahu at Marine Corps Base Kaneohe Bay. Okay. So we, were, we flew over there, we conducted our training, and we were flying back across the Molokai Channel, and it's 
we were halfway. So it was either back to Molokai or push home. Okay. And, and that was it. And heard a strange noise in the back, started smelling something funny, went to the back and my utility pump, so which provides utility hydraulic power to the aircraft, sure. was glowing red. And as I'm walking to the back, it exploded. Um, so we lost utility power. Okay. Um, not really a big deal. There is a redundant system. Mm -hmm. However, you know, the cabin's full of oil and fumes and things like that. You're risking, you know, a fire. Right. And the pilot's like, well, we can go home or we can turn around. And it was 50-50 either way. So we just limped it back home. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was my first pretty dicey situation. Okay. And then uh, another one that sticks out, we had just landed on a small uh, helicopter carrier um, and got fuel. And so both engines were, both fuel bladders were completely full, about 3,200 pounds of fuel. And as we lifted off the deck and transitioned to forward flight, our number two engine just shut down. And we dipped down into the water, kind of drug the helicopter through the water for about 100 yards until we were able to get enough forward momentum and lift to get it out of the water and then flew it back to base about 20 miles away with just one engine. Wow, that sounds like something you'd see in the movies. Yes, and once we got to home base and landed, where everyone's doing an inspection, trying to figure out what happened, and we just tried to start the engine and it start and ran fine and never had a problem with it since. Oh, it was that's... just a freak thing that happened. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Now tell us, you, you, you obviously switch gears here and you get on this, presidential detail type yes. thing. Tell us about that. People, what's the behind the scenes? It's, it's very interesting. Okay. Um, the movement of the president uh, is the number one priority of the military. Mm -hmm. If they're, they're involved in every movement that he makes. Mm -hmm. And my job was uh, production scheduling uh, for all the maintenance planned and unplanned on the presidential helicopter fleet and then scheduling those aircraft to go to the various locations the president visits mm -hmm. to support him. And the, the job is apolitical, mm -hmm. so there's no appointments or, or anything. It's just, this is our job. We support the Office of the President of the United States. And I would, I worked a lot of hours. Believe it or not, that was the toughest job that I had. Uh, combat was a relief to, to that job because really? Yes, it was a, you know, 14, 16 hour day on average, mm -hmm. um, 75 to 100 emails a day that needed to be answered to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the movement of the president is a very choreographed thing. So the president say he was recently here in Detroit uh, to give a speech at the um, auto show. Mm -hmm. And wherever the president goes in the world, there's gonna be at least one helicopter with him. And that is to support any type of emergency situation. Uh, when he was visiting here, they were doing a motorcade from the airport to the venue and back. So there was just one helicopter here for an emergency situation. Okay. Now, if the president leaves Detroit and he's going to Milwaukee and then going to Greenbow, South Carolina, wherever he goes, there, I was in charge of scheduling the aircraft and personnel to go there. So it was uh, very intricate in the planning mm -hmm. and the support. Um, when we were moving the president, everything stopped. Mm -hmm. So if, say for example, there's a jet loaded with equipment that has to go to Iraq to support the, the effort there. Mm -hmm. If something happened to the helicopter or the jet that I was gonna be flying on, I would steal that one. I had the, the authority and the power to say, that jet's mine. Wow. And they would download all the gear off that, we would take it mm -hmm. and, and complete our mission. It was the number one priority of the, the military is to move the president. Wow. And so everything stops when he's moving. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it can be very interesting. It, you know, it's not as planned as, you know, things aren't spontaneous with the president. Gotcha. You know, uh, I remember, fondly remember uh, President Obama mm -hmm. stopping at Ben's Chili in, in the DC. Mm -hmm. I knew four days ahead of time that this unplanned event was gonna happen because they just can't do that. And you know, the, our, our office mm -hmm. um, received a lot of criticism and so did the president's office. Well, the president's not going to this flooded area quickly enough or he's not going to this tornado zone quickly enough. And it's just not that easy. The infrastructure has to be there to support 
the president. Okay. His safety and security is paramount. Wow. Did you strike up any unique friendships uh, that you uh, otherwise would never have struck up? I don't know if I'd call them <laughs> friendships, but I did meet some interesting people. Okay. Um, during the State of the Union, there's one person, who's, one person who's designated as the designated survivor. In case of a horrible event at the, white, at the Capitol, there's one government official that's singled out. Okay. And so there's a facility in Washington, D.C. that we would work out of. And uh, <coughs> uh, Justice Alito was the designated survivor. And I got a call, hey, he's running early. Make sure security knows so you can get him in the gate. As I go running down the hallway and round a corner, he's already in the building and I ran smack dab into him. And all I could think to say is, Your Honor, you're early. <laughs> and so we had a laugh. So, so that was that was kind of neat. So it was, uh, so so it was a justice. It was not uh, Kiefer Sutherland. No, 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 no. It was the actual <laughs> Supreme Court justice. Yes. <laughs> That's kind of amazing, though. Yeah. That, uh, and um, Camp David, uh, mm -hmm. interesting interactions up there. Mm -hmm. um, President Bush was very folksy, very friendly. Yeah. He was a down to earth. He has that reputation. Yes, yeah, down to earth, yeah. genuine guy. Mm -hmm. And when he would go to Camp David. Within 15 to 20 minutes, he was on his bicycle riding the trails. And he would ride down to the hangar where we kept the aircraft, and he'd walk around the room. All right, you're new, you're new, you're new. Hey, Nick, let's go. And you're new, get a bike. And you'd go ride the trails with the president. And he would tell you the history of Camp David wow. and discuss things that happened there, significant events, you know, the um, peace accords with Egypt and Israel, mm -hmm. and all those things that happened up there. He would, he would tell you the stories. It was very interesting. You know, he, he came off as a good old boy, but he was very knowledgeable of, of history and of, of what went on. And so that was interesting. Um, and I, I remember, you know, the thing was if the president or his guest came into a room or a part of the facility, you discreetly just left. Uh, Camp David's time for them to have their own time to relax, away from the press, away from everything. So there's a library and there's a, a camp photographer and he records every presidential visit to the camp. And those photographs stay on camp. Um, actually, to date, um, there hasn't been one photo leaked um, from Camp David. It, they take it that serious because it shows an intimate side and a personal side that may skew some appearances. And uh, they have photo books. And I leak to go into the library and look through them just to see the history. And I'm in there one night and I hear the door open. It's President Bush. And I closed my book and I put it on the shelf. I said, have a nice evening, Mr. President. And he looks at me and he says, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm done here. He goes, no, you're not. He goes, I'm thinking you Marines don't like me. Every time I come into a room, you run away. <laughs> I kind of laughed. He goes, let me show you something. He, he goes over and he kind of looks through and he grabs a binder out and he's thumbing through the pictures and he says, look at that. And it was the family portrait that they did when his father was president at Camp David. Oh, wow. And he, 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 I could see it like a twinkle in his eye, and it, it just he got excited, and he pointed to his dad. And he was, it's my dad, and you know, not many kids can say their dad's the president of the United States. And I'm thinking to myself, but you're the president, you, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 but he was very gracious about his father, mm -hmm. and so he, he closed the book and he put it on the shelf, and he says, now, he goes, Nick, you better get out of here because somebody's going to yell at me for talking to you, and then they're going to yell at you for talking to me, and I don't think either of us want to get yelled at tonight. <laughs> so we had a nice laugh and, and, and went away. Um, just Bush, Obama? Just or, okay. last three years of President Bush, the first three years of President Obama. Okay. Um, President Obama was an interesting, interesting mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. um, he was friendly in a different way. He was a matter of fact friendly. How you doing? How's it going? You know, but he, he knew your name. You know, I, I, I interacted with them a little bit more often than other folks did just because of the position that I held. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he would remember your name. Mm -hmm. And he knew, he was, oh, hey, he, he knew your rank. Mm -hmm. He knew every, so it was, it was, it was different. It was friendly, but it was just a different kind of friendly. Nice guy. Mm -hmm. They were both very nice mm -hmm. um, and, and both very engaging. You know, Nick, in the, in the type of position that you were in at that point in time, how much interaction did you have in your capacity with something like the Secret Service, or or did you, or was there a absolute finite line that separated? No, there was there was intimate uh, action with the 
um, Secret Service because okay. their plans, our plans, we had to mesh. Gotcha. And the Secret Service needed to know which of my folks were going to be traveling, mm -hmm. who was traveling with them, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, to get into that position also, you had to go through a security screening process, mm -hmm. which um, I ended up with a top secret security clearance. Mm -hmm. um, and contrary to popular belief, there is nothing higher than top secret. The Department of Energy has their own security ratings, which are different, but for general purposes, there's no, nothing higher than top secret. However, there are different compartments within the top secret world that you can be allowed to have or enter into. And I ended up with a top secret Yankee white clearance, which gave me one-on-one -on -one access to the president. Mm -hmm. So I could be in a room alone with the president, no secret service. And it was a very extensive background investigation. They mm -hmm. came back to Truman, now Taylor High School, mm -hmm. got my transcripts. They talked to a couple of teachers that were still there, mm -hmm. friends, family, you know, it, it's about a six month process to do this background check. Wow. And so, yes, you end up with, with that. And then I had several other compartments that I, I can't discuss that I was attached to. When you look at your, your service, uh, in the Marines on the whole. Uh, what was your favorite takeaway and what was the least favorite? What was the... Uh, my favorite takeaway would be the friendships and the camaraderie and the new family that I, I gained while I was in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. There's a group of us that all went to Desert Shield, Desert Storm uh, together. Every two years we have a reunion and there's 10 to 15 of us, maybe 20, depending upon what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we get together and it's like nothing's changed. It's like we, had, we hadn't been apart for any period of time. Mm -hmm. So the friendship, the camaraderie, it, it was a big takeaway. Also, um, a strong work, work ethic, you know, because you have to get the job done. Mm -hmm. You can't, uh, I'll do that later or I'll do that tomorrow. Sure. The job has to be done. Mm -hmm. And not just that, but the ability to think on my toes was enhanced, um, split second decision making, things like that, um, That those were all enhanced. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, like I said, the work ethic was the, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, it was, mm -hmm. it, it taught me a lot and it made me better at what I do now. Gotcha. What about, uh, what about the, I guess the biggest negative? The biggest negative? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, for me personally, mm -hmm. uh, I would say it was, uh, some inherited mental health issues okay. that right. came from being in that high stress environment mm -hmm. and combat operations, things like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that would be the biggest negative out of the thing. Mm -hmm. And fortunately or unfortunately, it, during my time in the military, mental health was not treated. It wasn't discussed. It was mm -hmm. shut up, do your job. That went on thing. for a long period of time. It went on for a long period of time. And as I was retiring, they were transitioning over mm -hmm. to getting mental health counseling and having people have the ability to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're living 24 seven in an environment of alphas, mm -hmm. one sign of weakness and the sharks are going to come in for the blood. Right. So you can't show that and you bottle it up and you suppress everything. Mm -hmm. And especially after a lengthy combat tour, all that gets released. So I would say that would be my negative takeaway was the, the, I hate to say damage, but the mental health strain that I went through that right. I'm now dealing with. I take it if you could do it all over again, you'd do it in a second. One second. There would be no hesitation. It shows, Nick. <laughs> no hesitation. I, yeah. I would go yeah. back in a, oh. in a second. Oh my God. Um, un unfortunately, I've hit that 30 year of service. Mm -hmm. So it, it's funny, when I retired in 2011, I was technically not retired. Mm -hmm. I was transferred to the uh, Fleet Marine Reserve, wow. okay? And I'm obligated for 30 years. So anywhere up to that 30 year mark, I could be recalled. So at the 30 year mark, I finally got my retirement certificate in the mail <laughs> where I could finally say that I'm retired. Oh, so, my you know, in a sense, I was kind of in limbo but it's very rare that people get recalled. I guess you were earning your points until that day came Yes, up. sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thank we you. really appreciate having you. Thank you, you Carl. I appreciate that it. That was interesting.